Good day, everyone. Thanks for listening in. Uh, I'll just begin by thanking people like who have been praying. I'm I'm now out of the isolation period. I'm now regaining strength and doing a bit of walking around and just gradually building up a bit of strength. So uh, I do thank you for your prayers and appreciate that. And uh, what I want to share today really is something a wee bit different. I want to talk about the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation and just some of the history of the interpretation regarding this book on this particular subject. I know with this current corona crisis, some people are saying that vaccinations are the mark of the beast. And I want to just look at that as well and just look at that, look at this particular teaching in, in light of the current situation as well. So I'm going to begin by reading just the whole of chapter 13 and then we'll just, just look at this. So it's going to be a bit different this morning or the day, but uh, let's see how we go. It says in verse 1, And he stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads there was the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, it had feet like a, a bear, mouth like a, a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And he saw one of his heads as, as it were, were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who was like unto the beast? Who was able to make war with him? And it was given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue for forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and then that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all they that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world if any man has an ear let him hear he that leads into captivity shall go into captivity he that kills with the sword shall be killed by the sword here is the patience and faith of the saints and he beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven and on the earth in the sight of men. And deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of these miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life of the image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or on their forehead, <clears throat> and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding 
count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred and sixty-six. So this is Revelation chapter 13. And it's uh, one of those famous chapters where we have this uh, mark of the beast. And just to really to summarize really in a very a very basic summary, what we have here really is first of all you, you have a beast that rises up out of the sea with seven heads and ten horns. And there's a beast that rises up out of the earth or land as well, who's got two horns like a lamb and he speaks as a dragon. And this second beast from the land causes the people on the earth to worship the first the first beast that came from the sea. The second beast does great wonders and again he instructs the people of the earth to, to, to worship and to to worship the image of the beast and anybody that uh, refuses is killed and he also causes people who are all people rich and poor small and great bond and free to receive the mark of the beast on the right hand or forehead and you cannot buy or sell without this mark or number and of course in the number when it's added up it comes to 666 so this is basically the the, the basics of the uh, the chapter and you actually have there actually is a in in, in the church a history of different interpretations of this and uh, <clears throat> I don't normally really spend a lot of time with different interpretations of scripture, but I think the book of Revelation is is quite unique. And it's unique because many Christians, many solid Orthodox Christians who believe the fundamentals of the faith uh, will differ when it comes to the end times and the, how they interpret Revelation, and I say this. To, I say this to say that when somebody says you know, dogmatically, "This is what the book is saying," this is what the book, the mark of the beast is. I think we should at, at least be uh, uh, cautious, not just to uh, accept. Uh, everything that's said that the person may be right may be on the ball but at least be aware that there is a history of interpretation in the church and it's just worth just just checking things out and not just uh, following everybody who has a, a dogmatic idea of what the book is saying I say uh, there's many people who, I mean, all uh, Orthodox Christians believe that Jesus came to this earth. He was born of a virgin. We all believe that he died physically on the cross and that he was buried. And three, three days later, he rose from the dead physically. And then he ascended into heaven after that, 40 days after that. And we all, all Christians believe that, that Jesus Christ will come again physically and bodily to this earth uh, to judge the living and the dead and establish an eternal kingdom. You know, we all in some way believe that. But again, when it comes to the finer details of end times, you'll find there will be various... <clears throat> interpretations and ideas that's why we have to kind of just allow for a little bit of leeway when it comes to this 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 this, this topic but uh, I want to just share again some of the history 
of the interpretations of the book of Revelation. Just to, just to make you aware of this history and just to, and that there is just you know, various views. And uh, so there's basically, you could say, four main schools, if you like, of interpretation. And uh, in those schools, if you, and in each school you'll find there'll be even people in that, they will differ in how they interpret it, but I don't have time to go into all the fine detail, but just, there's basically four main schools of interpretation. And those are, number one is what's called, you know, preterist. <clears throat> number two is historical or historist. Number three is what's referred to as idealist. And number four then is futurist. So you mightn't have heard of those terms and will not labour too much with them, but I just want to give you a basic idea of what each of those four schools, what, what, what way they are approaching the book. Again, the first one is called the, uh, the Preterist interpretation and basically the, the the word preterist comes from a latin preter which means in the past and this school sees that you know the the majority of revelation is has been fulfilled in the first century or close to the time that it was written now there's two types of preterism. There's what's called full preterism, and they believe even Jesus Christ has has, has come already, and Christians reject that as, as as heretical. They don't accept that. But there's many Christians who who would call themselves you know, partial preterists, in that they believe that much of the prophecies have been fulfilled. But of course, we still have we're still awaiting Jesus Christ to come physically and bodily. They're called preterists or Orthodox preterists, and they believe again that most of the book was fulfilled in the first century, and they would believe their 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 they would base a lot of their beliefs on the very first uh, verse of Revelation, where. Uh, John says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God has given to show his servants things which must, must shortly come to pass. And they would look at the word shortly and then they would see that as, you know, he's, he's speaking to people in the first century in, in Asia Minor, Christians. And he's talking about things that would, that would shortly come to pass. And the idea is that they would read that and they would just take shortly as meaning shortly and uh, they would see it as a reference to their their lifetime and many of this school would see then the beast the the, the the beast in revelation chapter 13 the first beast to come out of the sea they would see it as a reference to the roman empire which was the empire of that day and many would see, again, the, the, the Caesar at that time was a man called Nero. And he was uh, even referred to by some of the people of that day as the beast. Because he behaved in a very cruel and beastly manner. He, he even killed his own mother. <laughs> you know, he's a pretty, pretty gruesome guy. He'd done some pretty rough things. And he was a... Uh, great persecutor of the Christians and at that time there was a thing called uh, emperor worship where the emperor was the, the Caesar was looking to be worshipped as God and those that refused were uh, persecuted and killed and of course the Christians refused to acknowledge the emperor the emperor the Caesar as Lord and Caesar, and Nero had many Christians uh, persecuted and killed. Some were even burnt alive and used as torches 
in his garden parties. This was a pretty gruesome kind of guy. And uh, many would see the beast as, re as referring to the Roman Empire and then him specifically as the Caesar at that time. And when it comes to the uh, the mark of the beast, uh, it's interesting that uh, back in the ancient world, you'll find that, or the, you'll find that the ancient languages, Hebrew, Greek, and uh, Latin, which was a language of the Romans, uh, you'll find that that numbers were actually. They didn't have numbers as we do, but they used actually letters to represent numbers. And every letter had a numerical value. We have the same thing uh, today. We, we, we still have links to that today with the our Roman numerals. If you have an old clock or if you read any old books, you'll find that they'll still use Roman numerals where certain letters have numerical value. For example, you know, V equals five, X equals 10, you know, three, and that's, and that's the way, that's that system. Of course, we use a, the Arabic system of, of, of having separate numbers, but that was not the way it was in these times. And you could add up somebody's name their numerical value and come to and, and reach and get a certain number and it's been pointed out it's interesting that when you take the uh, the Hebrew for 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 Nero Caesar you get Nero and Kaiser and it adds up to uh, the, the, the numerical value in the Hebrew adds up to 666 so uh, I'm not saying this is ironclad, but many would believe and believe that the, that the, the, the reference to the, the, the number of the beast was uh, was a reference to Nero. And it could have been that people had to in some way give allegiance to him in order to to live, in order to, to have trade, to, to spy, to sell. That was part of that, uh, the way it was. It's interesting as well that John tells his readers, you know, to have uh, understanding and to count the number of the beast. So one would imagine that if, if you were in the first century and you were looking at this here and you were adding up the number, you, you know, that you would be, you wouldn't be getting a name that's two thousand years down the line. It would be something of, of that time. But that's 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 the, that's the first interpretation. That's preterism. The second one then would be the historist interpretation. And the historists believe that uh, from basically from the, the book was written right through to today that it's, it's, it's an interpretation of, of history. And there's various, uh, and in this school, people differ, differ as to how the history uh, relates to the book of Revelation, but that's the basic premise is that the historists believe that historical figures fulfill the interpretations or the the visions in the book. And one example would be that during the time of the of the French Russian wars, the Russian Orthodox Church were saying that that Napoleon was the Antichrist. He was the one who was looking to uh, destroy the churches and just create like just no religion and basically they seen Napoleon as the Antichrist and uh, you, go, you go to the time of the of the Reformation and you have men like uh, Martin Luther and some other reformers were saying that uh, the Pope was the Antichrist that was a belief during the time of the Reformation and on following. And uh, again, that comes from this historist school of interpretation. But then going on, another another school again is the idealist. 
And this school of idealism sees the book as not really so much referring to one specific prophecy or event, but they see it as like visions or parables of the general battle between good and evil that we have experienced throughout history and throughout the, the time of the church. They see it as more as a, as a general uh, parable of that struggle between good and evil. This school would look at and, and see again where the, the, the book starts off, Revelation starts off with uh, with uh, with John saying that, that, they, that this is a uh, that this is what will shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it unto his angel by his angel unto a servant John, and they would say they would look at the word signify, which means uh, to have signs or symbols. So the book really very much is it's symbolic, and. This school would look at the at the mark of the beast really as uh, if not referring to any specific one specific event, but it's a it speaks of the general of, of anybody or any regime that which which forces people to uh, to give allegiance to them absolute allegiance. It tells people that they must uh, serve them worship them they cannot worship anybody else and their their life and their ability to, to, to live and to move involves allegiance to them and that has happened historically there's been uh, regimes like you could say for example Nazi Germany you know communist Russia or communist China where you are expected to give absolute allegiance to the king or to the leader or to the system and if you're seen as giving allegiance to anything else then you're seen as an outcast you know and that's the case in the world today you know if you go into somewhere like North Korea and say Jesus Christ is Lord and preach that you know you'll pretty soon get into trouble because it's an example of, of a regime where you're, where you're meant to give allegiance to the leader and to the regime when you can't even trade, you can't even buy and sell unless you give that allegiance. So this, this school would look and see, see that as a fulfilment of the, uh, of the mark of the beast. They would also say again that, that the mark is not actually something necessarily literal or physical <clears throat> but it could be just a spiritual uh, idea and they would point to the fact that in the book of Revelation you've got even believers who are sealed by the Holy Spirit and they, have, and they have God's seal on their forehead and most would see that as, uh, as something spiritual not something physical you're not walking around with this physical mark on your forehead but the believers are sealed by God, and one would, and they, and they, one would think, well, to be consistent, then uh, the mark of the beast is not necessarily something physical. It's also worth pointing out in the book of Ezekiel that he he also had a vision uh, where he had uh, where there was a there was seven men with weapons, and one of these men actually. Uh, well, one of, these, one of these men had a, an inkhorn and a, and a pen and he went through Jerusalem putting a mark upon the people who, on the forehead of the people who were, who were showing anguish at the sins that were being carried out. And of course this, this vision is not a, it's not a literal event but it's a, it's a vision of what was happening in the spiritual where God's people were being marked out. And then when the actual physical events happened, like the Babylon the Babylonians attacking, uh, God would have would have then spurred his people. But the vision, of course, but the, the, the marking the marking of the people was something spiritual. 
So that, that, that's the, the idealist uh, interpretation. I'm just giving you a very basic idea of these things. But uh, if we go to the end, the, the fourth school of interpretation then is what's called the futurist <coughs> interpretation. And this camp believes that at least the majority of the Book of Revelation is still to come to pass. They would say, you know, when John talks about you know, that which will shortly happen, and he's using shortly in a very kind of you know, figurative way, you know, not necessarily, you know, it's going to uh, shortly, but in God's time, people, you know, so. But basically, th this this uh, th this school sees that the majority of the book as something has been fulfilled in future events, often referred to as the Great Tribulation. And this will be a time of, hence the name, a time of tribulation, a time of, of anguish in the world, and it will then accumulate in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom on the earth. And, I've, and, and in this school, you know, there's, there's again, there's various interpretations. Some believe in what's called the rapture, which basically means that the, that the, the church, the believers, will be physically caught up in the air and uh, carried up into heaven by Christ, you know, before the tribulation takes place. Others believe again that the Christians will go through the tribulation and they will, uh, there'll be one final coming of Christ. So uh, most believe again that this tribulation period lasts for a period of seven years. And that's based on a, a prophecy given in Daniel chapter 9. And again, that's another study as to why they believe that. But that's, uh, that's basically futurism. And it is probably, well, it is definitely the most common end time belief today in the church. But that hasn't always been the case historically. But futurism really became popular in the middle of the last century and uh, has become the most popular belief uh, today. So this is basically just again a summary of the four main views of Revelation. And I'm just doing this this morning just to just to give you an idea really of just that, that there is different views uh, held by sincere believers uh, regarding the book of Revelation and uh, just to be aware of that, that history. And uh, that's really my point of sharing this. And you know, my own view personally, you know, I, I certainly, I, I uh, in, my, in, my, in my early days of being a Christian, I would have been a strong uh, futurist. But I would say in recent times, I have certainly been more, uh, I've, been, I've, I've, I've been more prone to look at, to believe the ideas of, of, of preterism or partial preterism, should I say, uh, as well as some of the ideas of, of idealism. And that basically means that I believe that, that, uh, the, that the book of Revelation, like all the books of the Bible, did have a very much, did have a, a strong reference to uh, events at that time in the first century, that it meant something to the original people. But at the same time, the events, you know, have applications which apply to all times in history. As well as the, as well as the time that we're living in now, you know the the ideas that are in this book can certainly be applied to various people and institutions, which means the book is always always relevant in every generation. And I am a futurist in the sense that I do believe, obviously, that that Jesus Christ is yet to come, and that is the great ultimate theme of the book: is that you know everything that happens is that whatever's happening. God is in control 
and Jesus Christ will someday, sooner or later, he will come back. And that is our, our blessed, blessed hope. But again, that is my uh, my basic taking of the book. And uh, it's not something I'm going to be dogmatic about. If you've got different ideas, different beliefs about it, I'm okay with that, no problem. As I say, like, it's, not a, it's not an area I'm open to, to discussions and I'm open to listen to people's different views. You know, there are some areas in, in the Christian faith where I will be dogmatic when it comes to you know, who Jesus is and uh, how, to be, how, to be, how to be saved, born again. And, uh, there are certain things which are you know, of primary uh, importance and uh, where it's important to be dogmatic and not to be tolerating in the church voices that would be contrary to those very basic fundamental beliefs. But there's other doctrines which we, which we could call secondary, where we, have, we, where we are prepared to allow a little bit of leeway for different kind of ideas. And, uh, but that's it. You know, you, you'll find generally that uh, the people will basically believe more or less what they've been taught, what, the, the, what their influences have taught them. And that is just human nature. It's the same all over the world, you know, even in, 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 in every environment, you know, people are brought up a certain way. They normally accept what their peers, their fathers, their teachers have taught them. And they'll be very zealous about their beliefs, even to the point of, of death nearly, they'll die for their beliefs. And uh, that's just human nature. And But it's sometimes it's a good thing to be able to listen to different people, different ideas about things, and the truth is nothing to is nothing to fear from different ideas, because the truth will always hold up. You know, I've sort of listened to different beliefs and studied different things, but I still certainly am a firm believer in the truth of the Bible as the Word of God. But it's just good just to have you know, you know, just to be willing just to listen to different ideas because you, you, I find that you do sometimes it does broaden your understanding of things yeah, praise God so I would also say that you know ideas do have consequences even though what's called the end times or the word uh, is eschatology uh, you know end time belief even though it may be in some ways you know, secondary ideas do have consequence and therefore it can be it's still important that we understand things in a proper way and for example uh, you know for example of this would be that there's people who have, who have who have sold their houses sold their businesses believing that Jesus Christ is going to come back a certain time on a certain date. And this may be more, you know, extreme. Some extreme cases I'm given here, you know, but the, but that is an example of how your beliefs can affect your your behaviour. There's been those that have sold everything, and then they've been left disappointed, disillusioned, and also very poor as well. You know, so. Uh, there actually was a guy one time recently uh, called Harold Camping and, and he put a lot of money advertising into giving certain dates as to when, as to when Christ would return. It didn't happen and of course then his followers are disillusioned. He has to revise his predictions, come up with a di different date and that's the way has, the history has been. you know. And, there was actually a guy one time wrote uh, 88 reasons why the rapture must be in 1988. And of course he had to make a, a revision of that book as well. So there's a history of this. You know, you can look at the year 2000. People were stocking up food supplies, believing there's going to be a global computer crash. And they'd have to, uh, they wouldn't be able to buy or sell. 
to be the market based and people were stocking up food supplies and of course you know basically nothing happened everything went on as usual and uh, you had 2012 it was the end it was it was then the end of the mayan calendar and there was people were saying that that was going to be a great time of there was books written that say that was going to be a time of calamity as well and of course nothing happened there as well <clears throat> you have things like the iraq war people were talking about armageddon you had the rise of isis ones were saying that's going to be bring in the the end times and and it just goes on and on. There's a whole history, really, of this kind of idea. And uh, I'm just saying this just to be to be aware of this kind of history. And that's why when it comes to uh, uh, coronavirus, and there's people now saying that these uh, lockdowns are a, an attempt by uh, some kind of hidden... Satan inspired people to bring about the uh, new world order, the, the Antichrist, to bring about control, to bring about people, to, 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 to control people's life. People are not submitting to the, the restrictions because they believe it's all about control. It's all about controlling your life. And again, I'm not saying that, I, I can't say for certain that that's not the case, but I'm just saying to be aware of this history. And uh, some are saying that the vaccinations are, are the mark of the beast, or, 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 or that they're leading up to the mark of the beast. And I would just say again in reply to that, that there's nothing in, this, in the vaccinations that resemble the mark of the beast it is uh, there's no microchips there's no it's not going to affect how you you know buy or sell like you do take this vaccination uh, it's not going to affect your allegiance to your faith to how you worship there certainly is laws that are attacking those things but uh, and that's another subject but this, but not so much uh, in vaccination it's basically uh, that's not in the, the mark of the beast and uh, you could argue for, if you could say for argument's sake you know that this even if it does even if this is the beginning uh, of something bigger well you know when it comes to faith when it comes to to practice of of of, uh, of your belief when it comes to your freedom to to buy or sell to believe as you, as you ought to believe then almost then certainly yes anything that anything any law that prohibits that or that says you have to believe a certain thing worship a certain way that you have to live a certain way and you can't do this do that then certainly i would be against that completely you know god has given us liberty and he's given us the liberty to, to worship him according to our conscience so I, so that is something but uh, I don't think this vaccination really is uh, is is that praise God so uh, you know uh, I'll just close briefly you know time is moving on and I uh, just want to make a few basic points about this vaccination I don't want to you know uh, People have their own ideas about whether they should be vaccinated or not and i'm not going to tell you today you know what to do that's not my but i'm just going to give you a few, a few basic facts and then you can make your own uh, choice in regard to this we all know that there, there is a current push towards uh, vaccinations that's that there's a current push towards that and uh, because of this nature of this virus and it would seem that the vaccinations are the best way really to get out of this situation and have some kind of uh, normality but basically you know a vaccination is basically an injection which this is very basically layman's 
terms, it's basically an, 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 an injection which is designed to trigger a, a response in your body to generate immunity from, from, the, from the virus. It basically is, is a, an injection designed to trigger an immune response in your body. Then when the real thing, if it comes along, your body is prepared. You could say it in, in the military terms, it's like having having soldiers trained ready to in case of an enemy attack. They're sort of prepared and ready and trained, you know. And vaccinations have saved many lives in recent times of so many diseases. You could talk about polio, tetanus, hepatitis A B, measles, chicken pox, diphtheria, flu. These all have been, you know, helped. People have been helped from these diseases by vaccinations, so certainly they have had a positive and a good effect upon society. Some are saying that vaccinations won't be safe because they've been, they've been created so, so fast, so quickly. And of course, you know, we cannot prove absolutely the safety of vaccinations because that ultimately takes time and we don't obviously have time at the minute but uh, all I would say is that a lot of money has been put into this to the, to the creation of these vaccinations by even governments and uh, they have been approved by well-established uh, regulatory bodies and, uh, and there has been testing done but some might feel that it's, it's very quickly and you're not willing to take that chance and that's fair enough but you have to make your own decision regarding that some question you know, the ethics regarding the manufacture of vaccinations and uh, it's true that some you know, vaccinations basically to create them you have to grow cells and uh, some of those some of those cells in their original form were taken from aborted babies that, that is true uh, as far as I know the babies were not ab they, they weren't aborted for that particular purpose but the medical profession in some cases has used these cells as like uh, they're like prototypes to create other cells like a cell line uh, in the development of a vaccine and uh, but the, in the in, in the final vaccine there's that there's no tissue from an aborted baby but just in the original the, the source there is that there and that that is that creates a problem for uh, many people and uh, some would say they wouldn't take a vaccine because of because of this connection. Others say others are saying, well, they may not agree with some of the process of the creation of some of these vaccines, but the greater good of protecting society, of uh, removing this virus, of creating a, a safe society, of loving your neighbour, protecting the vulnerable, uh, the greater good is. Uh, is also something to be considered. I know some pro-life groups, some Christian groups have been lobbying some of these pharma firms to change their methods with varying degrees of success. Some will because some are more conscientious than others. Some will, some, some firm basically just, the main issue is, is profit. I mean, that's just, that is the world we live in, I you know, and uh, there is these kind of issues in the church, you know, you know about what we should 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 do or, or shouldn't do, and it's not something new. There's always been these kind of things in the church. You know, you go back into even back into the time of the New Testament, and the, the big issue was, you know, about was eating meat sacrificed to idols. There's some some people, and they wouldn't eat meat; they only ate vegetables. Because they believed they believed in, that in eating meat that, that there was a potential that that meat had been used in a pagan temple, 
or, or some of that meat was used in a pagan temple and sacrificed to an idol god and then the remainder was then sold in the market and they, and they felt that if they were eat, eating that meat that in some way they might have been partaking or identifying with this heathen practice others were saying well yes you know they were basically saying that meat's just meat those idols are nothing they're no, they're no real gods and meat's just meat and I'm going to just eat it and enjoy it and there was this contract there was this division but basically in these matters Paul basically says that uh, Apostle Paul says it's a matter really of uh, of conscience and it's a matter really it's not really black and white it's not it's just really down to the individual's conscience and I would say the same is true again with this uh, with when it comes to next vaccinations you know there's always been this kind of thing you know if you were drowning in the water somebody threw you in a rope and he, he knew that rope had been stolen you know would you grab the rope you know uh, most people probably would grab the rope you know but that doesn't mean that they agree with somebody stealing the rope you know uh, there's other illustrations you can use you know some guy talked about the fact of of, of their child if, if he had a child and that child was uh, needed a say a, a liver to live and somebody then you, you found there was a another another person had a, a liver to give you to give your child and that but that person had been killed in a car accident by somebody who was who was drunk you know so there is an example of something evil something bad but yet uh, good was able to come out of it and uh, so these things are they're they're tricky you know and it's hard to sometimes know exactly what to do and i would say when it comes to, again to vaccinations there's many different issues but i would say basically go with your conscience and what you feel is right don't be it's not good for believers to pressurize other believers and say you know you gotta do this or you gotta do that if you want to take the vaccinations then that is your choice if you don't want to take the vaccination that is also your choice you might want to wait for a while that is also a choice that you have but you just you basically you got to just pray about it and go with your own conscience and what you feel is is right for you to do some might say well what would i do and the answer is that the reality of it is that that some of the vaccinations i've already taken for example you know chicken pox as a child or hepatitis A for going to for going to Africa, those actually contain cell lines that have some kind of connection with uh, babies that were reported. You know, I didn't know that. I just when I go into Africa, I just basically say, "There's my arm, there's my arm, there's my arm." You know, stick it in, and if this is what I need, then so be it. It's only now that I'm actually realizing that the, that there is actually some some practices which where, where the ethics could be questioned. You know, so. Uh, you gotta just weigh it up. You gotta look at the big picture. You gotta look at your own family, and you know the importance of protecting your family. You gotta look at preaching the gospel and being able to travel as well and do those good works of preaching and the Lord's work. And the vaccinations are required. Then you have to look on, look on, you know. And to be honest, if a vaccination is required for travel somewhere like Africa, then. I would then, for the greater good, I would have to take it. Although I would, I do, I do believe in, in fighting for ethical practices, and fun, certainly putting pressure on these groups, to, these pharma companies, to do things in a proper way. Praise God! And uh, that's I've been on a bit this morning longer than what I really expected, but I just want to give you just just some of these ideas and thoughts. And again, I just encourage you to keep your eyes upon the Lord during these times. Keep uh, keep your eyes on things above. Keep your eyes upon Christ. And uh, God is on the throne. And he will help us to overcome and get through these times. And our faith, and, and our faith is upon him. 
and it's to him we give all the honour and glory and praise. So we just thank you for listening today. God bless you, in Jesus' name.